Hi, this is Matthew Baldwin from Mars Hill University, and this is the Ideas of Jesus video podcast, episode six. I'm joined here today by Dr. Chris Keith, who is research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, London, although you're joining us from Louisville, Kentucky. Isn't that right, Chris? That's correct. That's, that's correct. I'm, I'm bi-coastal, but, but different coasts than different the, coast. in the typical sense, yeah. Thank you so much for being here today, Chris. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for doing these, uh, doing this series. I'm excited about uh, about our conversation. Um, obviously, originally from the USA, Dr. Keith earned his PhD at Edinburgh in uh, Edinburgh, 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 Edinburgh. I said it right, okay. Uh, in 2008, where he studied with Helen Bond and Larry Hurtado, uh, Dr. Keith's an extraordinarily prolific scholar. Uh, whose work has won wide recognition among scholars of early Christianity, the historical Jesus, and the Gospels. He's the sole author of a number of award-winning books and editor and co-editor of several more, published numerous articles and uncounted numbers of book reviews. I believe you're also um, on the editorial board of the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus, or the Journal of Historical Jesus, and you're on the steering committee of the Society of Biblical Literature Historical Jesus Group. Yes, I am. Um, you lecture frequently on a wide variety of topics and reach and uh, has re you've reached public audience through blogs and other types of articles. Uh, the range of topics that you work on is impressive: uh, literacy in early Christianity, Judaism, the ancient world. Uh, and with special attention to the question of whether Jesus himself was literate. And we have mm -hmm. a lot of work on the role of memory in preserving oral tradition in ancient societies, and especially how that uh, research applies to the question of the reliability of the gospels. Uh, you've studied scribal culture in Christian antiquity and the gospel portrayal of Jesus as a teacher in conflict with the scribes of his time. You've studied the gospel manuscripts as material artifacts in early Christianity and the methods and theories by which we evaluate gospel narratives as evidence for the historical Jesus. Now, you have a forthcoming book, if I'm not mistaken, presenting your take on what has become one of the signature issues in recent studies of Jesus, which is what role we should give to the Gospel of John in presenting a true picture of who Jesus was in history. The book forthcoming from Yale University Press in 2021 is Jesus and John, The Quest for the Historical Jesus and the Gospel of John. So this book is sure to stimulate a lot of conversation, I hope, uh, will help to resolve what has become an enduring problem for historians interested in Jesus. I would say it's been, I was going to say 150 years, but I think even closer to 200 years since uh, the kinds of ideas emerged in scholarship that Albert Schweitzer would later succinctly describe as an alternative, a stark alternative, either the synoptics or John. Uh, I'm going to guess you think it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so I'm tempted to start right here, but rather than ask you to say what you think about uh, the relationship of uh, the synoptics and John, I, I want you to try to help lay people and students and other interested listeners try to understand the history of scholarship and so the question is, that I want to start with today is, in the past, why have scholars argued that John and the synoptics present two historically incompatible frameworks for thinking about Jesus's life and teachings? Thanks for the question. I think the short answer to that is the widespread and even ancient recognition that John was more theologically elaborate than the synoptics that, you know, John has an obviously higher Christology, uh, but he, has, he also has things like Jesus tied into the festivals that take on symbolic significance, and uh, he has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of uh, stories the synoptics don't, and so I think there was just a matter of familiarity and John being different to a certain extent. If the manuscript evidence is any indication, the Gospel of Matthew was by far the, the most popular of the Gospels uh, in the early centuries that, that, you know, for which we have manuscript evidence. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, who, who knows what's buried in the sand that we don't know about. But um, so I think there was just a certain, there was, a, there was already early on a recognition that John's just different mm -hmm. from the synoptics. And for whatever reason, the synoptics were taken as the baseline. 
Uh, and then when you get, certainly with the rise of deism and, the, and, and the rise of the enlightenment, you get the anti-supernatural readings of, of the gospels and all biblical texts at that time. John just sticks out like a sore thumb because there are parts of Mark that you could, you know, based on what, in, in any given period, the, the little amount that we know, there are parts of Mark, you know, that Jesus is walking into a synagogue. Okay, well, there were synagogues, and, and mm -hmm. we, we can safely assume people walked. And, and, you know, there are parts you could imagine this, this really happened. Um, then there are parts of John where it's just like, ah, you know, at, at all stages, people just kind of thought, no, this, this, is, this is his theological elaboration, and he tells you that it is. Uh, so I think that to a large extent is people just recognize that John is what John claims to be, which is a, the, a, a highly theological interpretation of Jesus' life. And you're basing that statement that John tells us that on the way that the gospel closes by describing its purpose or? Uh, that, but also, I mean, I, people often cite Schweitzer and his work going back to Reimarus and, and stuff like that. It's kind of the start of historical Jesus studies. I, I, I kind of demur from that. I think it, it, on that model, at least goes back to the deists. Mm. But even before that, I think in Augustine and in Origen, you see them handling the gospels in ways that look like what we would call historical Jesus scholarship. And I have not yet, but probably will push in print that, to a certain extent, what we call historical Jesus scholarship could at least be traced back to the Gospel of John, because John is more explicit about the fact that what he, what the narrator experienced at the time is not what he later came to believe. He outright tells you this. Jesus, Jesus said, destroy this temple. We didn't get it at the time. We later realized it after we filtered it through scripture and the resurrection experiences and stuff like that. So this distinction between the difference between what later faith came to believe and what really happened, that distinction is, is, is present in all of the early gospels, but it rises to a narrative theme in the gospel of John. So the gospel of John, um, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up in more conservative circles and uh, there's this, and I'm sure, are you in North Carolina? I sure am. Yeah, all right. So you, you're, you're very familiar with this, uh, with, you know, that kind of in inerrantist type approach to the biblical text that this is what really happened. Okay. John outright tells you this at multiple places. That's that what I later came to think is not what I experienced at the time. So the cognitive, um, the cognitive dissonance between what I later believed and what, would you would have experienced if you were walking around with us, you know, because the, the narrative portrays himself as one of the disciples on some level. Um, that's, that's a narrative theme in John. So John is explicit about the fact that what we, we later changed our minds and, and what truth is, what I regard as true is not necessarily what you would have experienced if you were standing next to Jesus. So that makes me want to ask the question, um, but I'm gonna, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So okay. I'm, again, a lot, for a lot of my listeners, uh, or my students, you know, who like you are coming out of a more conservative background where assumptions about narrative are rooted in what we would call fundamentalist or literalist approaches. Um, right. You know, you read it in the text and therefore it's just a straightforward description of what really happened. And they're not used to the way scholars just sort of automatically assume that there's a distinction to be drawn there. Um, and I know that, you know, Schweitzer talks about differences in the, in the, the historic, the chronological framework, even of John, just like in terms of a one year versus a three year right. framework, uh, a presentation of multiple visits through festivals and things like that, that are just hard to resolve. Um, how do you feel about the ways that 19th and 20th century scholars worked on resolving the tensions between the Johannine and the synoptic portrait of Jesus in terms of their, their writing about Jesus in early Christianity? Do you, are you, are you, do you share with them a concern that you can't easily resolve them? Or do you think that they uh, made a mistake through the baby out with the bathwater? What would you say about that? <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I do not share a concern to resolve them. Uh, okay. I'm very happy to let the Gospels be what they are. Uh, I think that's an obvious theological agenda driving historical research there. Um, I am endlessly intrigued by the, the theological pressure that people feel to do that. The, yeah. the relationship between their assumptions about the Bible and then what they meet in the Bible. Um, and, and we deal with this with students and, and colleagues all the time that, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the desire to harmonize is, you know, is, is early as Tatian. And, and so there's this, this, a, a drive to do that. Um, I was often intrigued. My last project was on the, the textualization of the gospels. And I in, introduced a term that is at least helpful to me, uh, of the competitive textualization of the Gospels. And one of the th points that I make in that whole book is among Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, as time persists, they become increasingly competitive with each other. They're trying to outdo each other. This is particularly clear at the beginning of Luke's Gospel and at the end of John's Gospel, where they kind of say, yeah, you, you can go to other places for stories about Jesus, but this is the best one. And one of the questions I would consistently get, I am coming back to your qu to That's question. That's fine. Yeah, this is interesting. Question. One of the questions I would consistently get was, well, why do, why do they have to be competitive? And our, my response was, why, wouldn't, why would it not be? Why, didn't, why wouldn't it have to be? And I really think that in most all the times I got those questions, I'm just dealing with the legacy of the fourfold canon, mm -hmm. this assumption that somehow they do fit together. So I, I uh, certainly understand the, the impetus for wanting John to fit with the synoptics. But I think the more honest thing is to throw our hands up and say, not only does John not fit with the synoptics at times, he does not want to. Mm. John is purposefully correcting the synoptics at various points. When John insists that Jesus carried his own cross, in my opinion, he's rejecting the idea that Simon of Cyrene did. Uh, you know, when John said, has Jesus in John 12 say, well, what am I supposed to say? Father, deliver, deliver this from, or uh, let this cup pass from me. Well, that's exactly what Jesus says in Gethsemane in the synoptics. Yes, so yes. John has Jesus rejecting even the idea that Jesus would say what he did say in Mark. And so I think if you're going to be honest, I mean, if we want to use the logic of fundamentalism, if you're going to take the text seriously, then John is purposefully contradicting them. So if you're, if you're forcing, if you're forcing them to fit together, you're not respecting the, the text integrity as a narrative because John doesn't want to fit with them in that way. Now there's a lot of other ways he does fit with them. So, I mean, I, I'm not acting like it's a, it's a zero sum game, but. Sure. That is so helpful to hear you lay that out that clearly and it's certainly a challenge to someone that i agree with you that this the nature of the canon the fourfold canon sends sends a message to people that these should be harmonized these are working together right. rather and it kind of conceals that competitive yeah civilization that you described well we have to remember too when we're talking about like for example 19th century scholars you know uh, thomas hadn't been discovered the Gospel of Peter hadn't been discovered. The Nag Hammadi manuscripts hadn't been discovered as a whole. So the wide variety of early Christianity, early Christian thought that we get to acknowledge now, they didn't have. So the idea that they, the canon, what I'm trying to say is that the appeal to the canon could have made things look even more homogenous than we know that they are because there were fewer options to compare them with. I mean, even the, the scrolls hadn't come along. Sure, I get you, yeah. Well, this kind of is a nice transition to next area. I wanna uh, talk a little bit about your work on the criteria of authenticity. Yeah. And just for the, for re, for the sake of listeners, you mean for, that, for whom that may be a little bit of a foggy term, um, the phrase criteria of authenticity is a, used to describe a series of rules that scholars, especially in the 20th century, used to uh, 
sift through the material of the Gospels and try to arrive at what really happened or what Jesus really did. And you, along with Anthony Ledon and a number of other prominent scholars, have pretty clearly argued that we can no longer rely on those criteria anymore. And does this mean it's impossible to use the gospel narratives to try to figure out who Jesus really was? Uh, if that's the case, uh, what should people who are interested well, in Jesus right be doing? <laughs> and if it's not the case, then what method should scholars be doing now, following now? Yeah. Um, the, the criteria of authenticity, uh, I loved working on that project and I love still talking about it because they really had reached kind of canonical status in some historical Jesus scholarship. And certainly in uh, undergraduate education in America, you would find the most. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and there's a certain pedagogical use. I mean, I did too. When I would teach historical Jesus stuff in undergrads, I would introduce the uh, criteria of authenticity. There's a certain, Mark Goodacre makes this point very well. There's a certain pedagogical value to getting them to think about, you know, the fact that, you know, how you use these texts or the fact that there, there are things in the Gospels that clearly couldn't have happened and there are, some, there are things in the Gospels that probably clearly could have and, and the question is how to sift one from the other. My big problem, uh, and, and everybody that contributed to that book, Jesus Criteria and the Demise of Authenticity, did, did not necessarily agree on what's problematic about them. We just all agreed that they're problematic. And there were a handful of us, um, me, Jens Schroeter, uh, Dale Allison, Rafael Rodriguez, who represented the extreme view that the criteria are broken beyond repair. Mm. Deliver what they say to deliver. For me, the problem was I had worked in social memory theory on my master's thesis and come and and, and came into historical Jesus studies uh, with that approach to tradition in the background. And uh, if I could lightly correct one of the uh, introductory comments you made, the, the approach okay. to memory I have has nothing to do with preserving oral, oral tradition or okay. preserving the past. Uh, the particular brand of sociological views of memory that I, that social memory theory refers to goes back to Maurice Hobwalks, who also is really clear saying he's not talking about what happens in people's brains, and he's not talking about the preservation of what we might call the actual past. Hobwalks was really intrigued by, um, and I'm, I'm, come, I'm again coming back to what you asked, but the, um, he was really intrigued by the mutual influence of the present and the past on any commemorative activity. So he was interested in memory in the sense that any time a present culture or individual in that culture holds up a piece of the past and says, here's a memory. His point was that that is entirely dictated by the present, whether it happened or not. I mean, he's really clear about this. He's not talking about th things that really happened. He's just interested in the way that the present makes the past useful for its own purposes. And then the whole discussion carried on where uh, people said, well, look, the president doesn't always just run roughshod over the past. Sometimes the past in impacts, its, impacts the present and it constrains historical uh, interpretation. So, for example, we're in the there's a variety of interpretations available of 9-11 but you have to deal with the fact that the Twin Towers are no longer here. Sure. So there's a certain element of the past that we all inherit and it restrains exactly what type of interpretation we can do. And in some cases, that's the case. So the central insight though of social, <coughs> social memory theory is that the past is always formulated on the basis of the needs of the present. So there's really no extricating the present from the past. Mm. You can only remember from the perspective of the present. Uh, so the criteria of authenticity were founded on this form critical notion that you could separate authentic bits of the Jesus tradition from inauthentic bits of the tradition. And I described that that way on purpose. They're interested in the bits of the tradition, the little pieces, mm -hmm. right? So you would get um, them saying this saying uh, this particular saying, um, let's say, um, boxes have holes. 
This, I was getting ready to say, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. All right. All right. That saying may go back to the historical Jesus. But the whole story around it has been concocted based on the needs of the present early Christians, right? right? Now, they were right about the present of the early Christians impacting the way they formulated the tradition. Where I think they were totally wrong was the idea that we can look at the narrative and just pull it apart and say, this piece is A-OK -okay, and this piece is later interpreted tradition. So I don't believe that it, it, I've said in print, they might as well have been, the search for authentic tradition, they might as well have been looking for Atlantis or unicorns because it, they ne it never existed. If we're going to play by those rules, all tradition is inauthentic. There's no such thing as authentic because what they meant was uninterpreted aspects of the past. But the fact of the matter is the past, whether it's a made up past or it's a past that really happened, none of it gets formulated for the present without interpretive categories. So you just can't, ex then, so here's coming back to the stuff on John. The only way that any of the past, again, whether that means something that happened or something that was made up about it, the only way any of it gets passed on is through interpretive categories. So the operative question is not, is this authentic? For me, the operative question for historical Jesus, que uh, historical Jesus questions is, why would early Christians have thought this or said this? And it may be, and that is the port of entry into answering any historical Jesus questions. And not, at least for me, there are some questions we just don't get answers to, and there are questions, there are some other questions that we can. But you have, it starts with saying, why would they have thought what they thought? I'll give you a brief example, very okay. brief, and then I'll shut up. No, that's so, fine. We're here to, hear, here to listen. <laughs> so, for example, if you work under the old model, where you're really talking about whether you could basically taste, uh, take a same and, you know, run it through a litmus test and say, oh, this is authentic. Jesus would have really said this. Um, you get these, you would get these really interesting conclusions. So Boltmann, for example, for example, would say about the controversy narratives, uh, not just would say, did say, they're all imaginary. All of the stories about Jesus in conflict with other Jewish teachers are total constructions of later Christianity. But he affirmed that it's inherently likely that Jesus really did have conflict with other teachers of the law. So he, he produced this conclusion as like, well, Jesus did the exact types of things that these texts claim he did, but these texts can't be trusted. And, uh, and then Gunther Borkum would, would affirm that all of the passion predictions, passion and resurrection predictions are later creations of the early church but that Jesus probably really did foresee his death mm. in Jerusalem. So you get these weird conclusions where it's like, well, we can't trust any of the text, but that probably really did happen. And what you see is a difference between whether they're judging the status of the tradition versus asking a general historical question. Is it likely that Jesus foresaw his death? Is it likely that Jesus got in conflict with, um, with other teachers? So for me, to answer your question about what can we do, yeah. I don't think we can test individual pericope. I do think we can answer some general historical questions that the texts give us. Did Jesus die in Jerusalem? What did he do in Jerusalem? What's significant about Jerusalem or Galilee or any of the others? But there are some questions we can, some questions we can't. But what we can't do is pretend that we're actually going to get behind the text. There's no getting behind the text. Well, that's... That is fascinating and such a helpful exposition of your view on memory. I'm sorry if I misrepresented that. Uh, there are people who are talking about memory and attempting to ask uh, the question of the reliability of the Gospels by appealing yes. to memory. And certainly, I think in a Candida Moss's review of your book for the Daily Beast, she brought up that specter of that whole movement, and I didn't mean to link you to that. Uh, so no, no, it's useful to clarify it, though, because there are yes. people who have jumped on board with this because I think they view it as a means of sneaking apologetics in the back in the back door. But in yeah. my opinion, the people who are doing that don't understand what the discussion is really about because you can't do that. 
re, re, I, I can't stand talking about the reliability or the trustworthiness of the text. I think that's just a... Uh, we're off on the wrong foot if we're talking about that. That's right. That's right. Like tr reliability for what? You know, uh, okay. it, it's... So I mean, we know the answer to that question, but it's just, as you and I know, as people who get to work in this type of stuff professionally, it's just the wrong question to ask. Sure. So one of the things that you were saying about your review about the general inauthenticity in some sense of the tradition uh, is it that reminds me of a very, what has been for me a very important saying or like methodological principle that I got out of Jay-Z Smith which is there's no pristine myth, there's only application. And this idea that you can go back and find something pristine, an original version, a first telling, is, uh, is just to ignore the fact that you've got an onion with layers and each layer is some new present where people are appropriating the prior tradition. Uh, would yeah, you... I would push it even further though. I mean, I don't, I don't like the onion metaphor because it, because it gives people the idea that we can peel it back. Right. But we can't. What we, we can't have is an back. unpeelable onion. <laughs> and, and, but here's, here's where I differ from a lot of people. So a lot of people would say, well, well, um, on the one hand, that means you can't do historical Jesus research. And I'd say, no, it means you can't do it that way. But the quest for the historical Jesus has always been bigger than the criteria of authenticity. Okay. And then you get the, the, the genuine surprise to me was the more conservative scholars who want to fight to keep the criteria of authenticity because I constantly always think like, don't you, don't you guys, and I mean, it's all, it's usually always guys. Uh, don't you guys realize that like this, this game's rigged for you to lose, you lose this game. Uh, and, but, uh, but they want to hold on to it because there's that vestige of the real that, you know, that they can at least kind of go behind enemy lines and to get, get the secular scholars, you know, how this works to admit that at least that one thing's true. And, you know, it, it, I mean, I don't know why they don't realize that for the rest of us, we're like, yeah, it's a little suspicious that when you use the criteria of authenticity, they always prove to be authentic. Yeah. Um, but for me, I, I'm interested neither in throwing my hands up and saying, we can't do historical Jesus research, nor am I interested in trying to preserve this way of doing it. We can't do it. What we can say is we've got an onion here. Why would we have an onion? Why does it take the shape that it does? Um, I might not be justified in saying that I know for 100% certain whether that's an onion or whether that's an apple that's been dressed like an onion. I don't know that, <laughs> but I do know that it's not a grizzly bear. Okay. So, so saying that I can't know everything isn't to say that I, I can't know anything. So I think for me, the gist of the whole thing is to say, we need to be a lot more honest about how little we know, but that doesn't mean that we know nothing. Okay. Well, th to me, this makes me want to return to the, your presentation of the topic of social memory just a little bit, because sure. one of the themes that you mentioned is this idea of the past and its impingement on the present. But then the other theme is the present and it's, is always making use of the past so that any kind of material that gets presented is, really a reflection of present concerns and practices. And I wonder to what extent that also describes the work of scholars who are work today, working today on Jesus. Um, how do we understand scholarly academic interest in Jesus uh, from a lens of social memory theory? That's a perfect, that's a great application. And I mean, there are, um, the work of my <laughs> colleague at St. Mary's, James Crossley, and others who have done stuff on, you know, like Jesus in the Age of Neoliberalism, Jesus in the Age of Terror, some of the books that he's written, looking at the way historical Jesus research reflects, whether consciously or not, the era in which it's done, it proves what we all know to be true, which is that our present context, whether that is, you know, a Southern Baptist seminary or um, a radical secular uh, mythicist pr approach. Our present context, whether wherever we see, I mean, I should have used radical for both of those, but- um, They are both radical. Yeah, yeah, they are both radical. 
um, that we, we all know that that drives our interest at some level or another. And there's no way, and, and what I think is, not only does it drive it, but there's no way to be interested in the topic outside of that. Mm. that you could have this level on the, you could have this discussion on the level of culture or on the level of language. So sometimes you get historians who um, lament the fact that we're trapped by language. And since language is necessarily interpretive, we're all, we never get to the authentic past, right? We're always trapped by the interpretive categories of, and the linguistic categories of the tradents, the in, um, who give us the tradition. And my, my response to that is, yeah, but if we didn't have those categories, we wouldn't have anything to work with. Mm -hmm. So the interpretive category of the church and their theological convictions might be what gets in the way of our historical questions, but they're, they're also the only means by which we can have the discussion at all. And I feel like it's the same, love, the same discussion at a cultural level for, for scholars. Yeah, your your context influences you. I mean, we we're in a field where the vast majority of people get into it out of some type of uh, devotional interest, uh, you know. And whatever happens after that, once you get in, is is anybody's game. But uh, I don't know why the field would want to deny that that's that that's a player in the discussion. I mean, we we know that's always kind of the elephant in the room whenever we're dealing with other scholars and and we know that other people are making those judgments about us um and you're constantly like shadow boxing with what you think their expectations are but uh you know it's also the case that if we weren't trapped in our present we wouldn't be able to have the discussion so that's also what enables it so to speak no, it's a, it's interesting it still feels like a conundrum to me i'm not sure I'm not sure how to resolve it. So sometimes I wonder whether or not we're feeding misconceptions by continuing to ask questions uh, of this this sort. Say more about that. What do you mean? Well, like I want to, I keep wanting to return to questions about who Jesus really was. I keep myself wanting to touch the real with full theoretical knowledge that it pro probably can't be done or that trying to do so means that I'm serving some kind of agenda that perhaps I haven't really fully surfaced. Um, you know, and my, the next questions on my list for you start to go towards that. Um, okay. and I want, asking you to apply some of your, your principles about like what might, what are probabilities um, to what we have, you know, like I want to know whether or not the picture in the gospels of Jesus as a very popular teacher or healer or exorcist in his own time are probably accurate or not. I want to know uh, what caused the early Christian movement to get rolling and start to develop uh, such that we have these gospels to this right. day to continue talking about. I, in my mind, there's a spectrum of the kinds of questions and what type of answers we can expect. And my book on John, which most definitely will not be available in 2021. Oh, it, won't right? even be, it won't even be off my laptop by 2021. <laughs> I just negotiated a new deadline with the uh, okay. press. But, <laughs> I was looking at an outdated CV then. The, uh, no, 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 it's not outdated. I just haven't, update, I haven't updated it. No, yeah, it, okay. or, or if it is outdated, it's my fault, not yours. No, that's fine. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna organize the book around questions that are answerable okay so not not evaluating traditions and they're authentic or inauthentic but saying okay what type of questions can we answer and so for example and the general questions would be the same regardless on the spectrum it's the kind of answers where it's, so let's look at an, an example where most historians would agree with uh, was jesus crucified sure most people would say, yes, he was. There's very little reason to make that up. If, if not, there's, you know, uh, we know that Rome crucified people. Uh, we know that Rome was killing messianic uh, leaders in this general historical time frame. You know, for whatever reason, we don't really doubt that Jesus really was crucified. And then if you move all the way <laughs> to the other end of the spectrum, you get something like the transfiguration. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, 
did this happen? And there, I think we're just playing with a bunch of stuff that the tradition is so enmeshed in their epistemological categories and ours are so different that it's hard for us to answer the questions that we're interested in because they're just not interested in those questions. I mean, as far as I can tell, they thought that really happened. Sure. But you, have, you, you said earlier that the right question to ask is why would early Christians represent Jesus in this way? And so then I right. want to just flip, flip that back on you and say, why would early Christians have represented Jesus going up on the mountain, being transfigured before right. his uh, two principal disciples? Right. So uh, to stick with that example, there are uh, any number of explanations that we could have. Right. Uh, if we were fundamentalists, we would say the reason they thought that happened was because it happened. Right. Right. Uh, or we might say uh, the reason <laughs> that happened is because they have an interpretive agenda to portray Jesus as one like the prophets, but greater. Mm -hmm. They have an interpretive agenda to say, well, the disciples were caught off guard by the death, but he had prepared them earlier by revealing his true identity. They just took a while to catch up. So here's here's earlier in the narrative where, you know, it's it's not the case that this all came up after the resurrection. Jesus, you know, that that they're trying to protect the idea that the disciples made it all up by saying, no, they didn't make it all up. They had hints of it earlier. We could we could postulate any number of answers to those questions. And then the historian's job is to go say which answer best accounts for what exactly we see. So, for example, and, and here's the thing that I would stress, and while I'm not willing to give up the quest altogether, even if you say the disciples made that up because they had a theological point that they wanted to make, theological points are, theological agendas are historical artifacts as well. So that doesn't that doesn't relieve us of the responsibility of asking historical questions. So Dale Allison has a great piece on the Matthean zombies about this, okay. about saying like, no, nobody really thinks that the tombs cracked open and people were walking around J Jerusalem. But what does that tell us about what Matthew wants us to think about Jesus? It tells us he's associated with the resurrection, that he is a messianic figure. And, and all of these were historical concepts that we can say at this point, particular place in time this is what these thoughts look like or something like that so one of the points is even if they're telling <laughs> telling lies they're telling lies that make sense in a particular historical context uh my book on the historical jesus and literacy mm -hmm. uh my ultimate conclusion is that the way mark portrays it that jesus gets rejected as a synagogue teacher because he's not one um that jesus was probably illiterate it, Mark is probably right there. But Luke has Jesus in the exact same story walk in and stand up and read a scroll. And I think Luke couldn't, I don't think G, the historical Jesus could have done that. But the question isn't, but then, so the criteria of authenticity is a one of those is authentic, one of them's not. We proceed with historical Jesus questions with the one that is. My approach in that book was opposite, was to say, all right, already in the first century, we have mutually exclusive options. What type of historical reality what could Jesus have been like to have generated both ideas about him? Because they're both theologically loaded. It's not as if one's theology and one's not. And this comes back to what I want to do with the book on John. Uh, I'm not arguing that John is more, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to open the book saying, I, I, John belongs in the quest for the historical Jesus. Not because John's more like Mark than we previously thought, but because Mark's more like John than we previously thought. Uh -huh. That makes sense to me. Yeah. I guess I mean, all we have is theological interpretation. So you don't get to just kick it out because it's theological interpretation, unless you're going to say, uh, we can't have any of that. But for me, I'm more interested in why did certain theological interpretation, even if it was totally made up, make sense in this historical context in the way it didn't. And I think that we can answer some historical Jesus questions as a byproduct of that type of research. So now you, you've tended to explain, it sounds like, and I like this term, the Gospels as uh, examples of competitive textualization. Yeah. And uh, we don't just list Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. We maybe list Q. I'm not sure where you stand on the Q hypothesis. Uh, we list Thomas. 
Gospel of Peter you mentioned. So we have this diversity of texts. Um, do we view them all as equally competitive? Do they are they grouped in families? And basically, I'm wondering about where do you think we stand as a guild on the question of the diversity of the early Jesus movement? I'm thinking, you know, do all the different movements portray Jesus in competitively different ways? The Pauline churches, the Syrian churches, the Alexandrian churches, uh, and so on. Do they all offer competitive accounts of Jesus? And what would explain that diversity? Uh, well, the, what explains that diversity is the diversity of people that are offering the views. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean to turn the, turn the question on its head, one way to approach this is to say, why would we not expect diversity? Like, it's not as if Second Temple Judaism was monolithic. It's not as, as if Mithraism was monolithic. Mm. You know, the, the, again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier. I really think that's probably a legacy of the canon where people expect it all to fit together, but it, it didn't. It doesn't even end the canon. Um, so, um, to the question, <laughs> my stuff on the competitive textualization of the Gospels is really on when they're being self-consciously competitive with earlier Gospels. Um, and I think this is something that happens. So, for example, um, Mark said, opens his Gospel saying, this is the Gospel. Uh, Matthew says, this is the book of the beginning of Jesus Christ. I think he's more self-consciously textual. Luke starts saying, yeah, lots of other people tried, but I did it correctly. You know, lucky for you, Theophilus, I came along to do this yes. correctly. And then John comes along at the end of his gospel and says, well, they all, they all tried. And yeah, there's other stories out there about Jesus, but this book is the one that leads you to salvific life. And because I'm the ideal witness. I think Bauckham actually is right about the role of the ideal witness as the narrator in the gospel of John. He's trying to say, I'm better. I, I'm a better at point of access to Jesus than anybody else. The gospel and then the gospel of Thomas, Thomas comes yeah. along. Thomas comes along and says, yeah, that's great that you guys have eyewitness. Luke, you talked to eyewitnesses. John, it's great that you were an eyewitness. Jesus dictated this straight to me. So you might be an eyewitness. I've got Jesus himself telling me this story. And then you, then in some of the Nakamati texts, you get similar stuff like this. Um, so I think there's a one-upsmanship that's happening with the tradition, but it's self-conscious in, in some cases. The way that this would work in historical Jesus research is very different. Um, yes, they're all competitive in the sense that they have something to say. I mean, nobody wrote a text in the ancient world by accident. It was a laborious undertaking. So they had to think they had something to say just to put it on text. But the way we rank our, our everything, is everything competitive and diverse? Yes, absolutely. Does that mean it's all just as useful histor for historical Jesus research? No, I don't think that it is. Um, because, for example, the Gospel of Thomas is not trying to set Jesus in a particular historical context. It's not trying to say this happened in Galilee, but this happened in Jerusalem. And this, you know, you do have some of the stock figures that it's taken over from the synoptics. I think Thomas was familiar with at least one of the synoptics. Um, but it's not offering what we might call a historical portrait in the sense that it's placing Jesus as a historical figure. Uh, whereas the, the other Gospels, regardless of whether we're convinced that they do it convincingly, they are making that attempt to say this is who Jesus was. So the types, the usefulness for historical Jesus research really depends on the type of thing that they're offering. It seems to me, I mean, the, my, my temptation, and, and listen to your very compelling presentation of these views, is, is to say, what I want to do is just retreat and study early Christianity as a movement and leave aside these questions about the founder, or what he really did, what he was really like. Although um, I, I confess, I still feel attracted to that question, but it's well, just, there's a lot of writing on it, but I, I'm one of the things I'm conscious of, and I know this is out of the bounds of our, of our scheduled plan to talk, but I, is Go how ahead. it actually gets hard <laughs> 
just as hard to talk about the earliest strata of the movement that follows Jesus as well, especially since we have really only one account. It's pretty late. In my view, it's late. And uh, it's, again, working with the past to work on the rep representations of the past for present purposes in its own time, the Acts of the Apostles. And right. so I, I guess we're, if we're interested in studying early Christianity, and we applied the same principles that you're talking about applying to the Jesus materials to that, we're really in the same boat. Yep. Yep, we are, because they're, 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 they are all portrayals of the past from the perspective and on, on behalf of the present. Any, and, and what we have to wrap our heads around, it seems like a trite thing, but what we have to wrap our heads around is that is the case for any portrayal of the past anywhere. Including our own. Including our own, even if, including our own, especially our own. Um, but even if, you know, it, I don't know if you use this in the classroom, but I used to use this metaphor in the classroom of, you know, if you could go back and videotape something, what would you have seen? But even that doesn't let us escape our inherent subjectivity. I don't know. If I, I, I used to use this example, this movie, but none of my students have ever seen it. The Life of David Gale, uh, Kevin Spacey's in it. Oh. And it's one of those movies where at the very beginning you get a videotape. They're, they're showing you what happens on a videotape. It's a particular death and you, and it has one impression, but by the end of it, the camera pans out to show you what else is going on. And you realize, Oh my goodness, even that didn't tell the whole story. So even if you could get a video camera somehow in time travel, you would only have that one perspective. Everything in the peripheral would be, no, I mean, there, there is I had the no exact same thing. exchange one time in a graduate school class with Bruce Lincoln, where he asked, what is the, what would be the ideal tool for a historian of pre-Christian uh, Europe? And I was like, a time machine and a video camera. And he said, no, even then it's a perspective. And you only see yeah. what the person is pointing the camera at. That's right. So there, there's just, historically speaking, there's, there is, Foucault was right about this. There is no panopticon. The, there uh, you, you don't get, you know, the all-seeing perspective. It's not available. So, um, so we should distrust anybody who claims that they have it. Uh, and we, and for me, I think there's a, some people grieve the fact that we can't have that wide perspective. But for me, I think, yeah, but look at everything that we do get. It's fascinating. You know, we're doing this for a living instead of something else, you know, uh, and so I kind of just embrace that that limited perspective is what we get and it's what makes it fascinating for us. And, and there's always, you know, we, there are always things that are outside our view that impact our theories. And I think that should drive us in the direction of saying, this is what I think right now. And, 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 and sometimes people perform this little bit I'm about to do. And what they mean is, well, this is what I do. And, and this is my view. And somebody else has a dip. No, I think that there's some views are better than others. I think I'm right about some things. <laughs> but that doesn't. Right. Uh, so I think that it, it should drive us to say, um, this is what I think right now. I'm confident that with this set of data, this is the best that I could do. Have I covered it all? No. And neither you or you or you or you or anybody yeah. else, you know, I think that's just the nature of the field. That's the nature of, of the, uh, the discipline, so to speak. Chris, that is a great place for us to bring this conversation to a close. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed talking with you. This has been really a great conversation. Thank you so much well, for sharing. Thank you for having me. And thanks to your students, if they were forced to listen to me and, uh, they're very, very fortunate to have a teacher like you uh, who's gotten their thoughts on these matters. And uh, I look forward to a lot of future uh, conversations, man. Absolutely. Next time. Until next time. All right. Thanks, man. I'm trying to stop the recording. And